Okay, so, so we were at the Ramsey 3K, and we just started to explore the problem that the probabilities and the degrees are different. So we need another low vast local lemma. And um, and um, in order for preparing that other low vast local lemma, let's just um, let's just define the dependency graph, which is sort of implicit in my explanation already. Uh, that so now here we have the events as before. The events we want to avoid. Um, so we want to be in the, in the intersection of complements of AI, so that's the same. But now we have a graph which is not a regular graph. And also each AI have different probabilities. And so what this graph, this is called the dependency graph, just simply describes that, for instance, if AI is connected with AJ1 and so on, AJ, AJL, then it just means that these are the neighbors, so it should be independent of everything except these. So these are the dependent guys. So this graph is useful to keep in mind, and um, um, so it's also useful to describe the so-called standard low vast local lemma. So the standard or asymmetric, asymmetric because you know it's not every degree is the same, um, is, oh, and another notation that, so NAI, as you expect, is the neighbors of AI, right? OK, so now I apologize in advance, because this standard low vast local lemma, if you see at first, it's hard to absorb. So let me try to um, explain it. So unlike in the original LLL, we have these extra variables, which actually you have to find these numbers. So if there are such numbers between 0 and 1, such that the probability of AI just happens to be less than this expression for every i. And so what is this expression? Well, this expression is zi times 1 minus the zj's, where, and it's important that this product does not run over everything, just over the neighbors. So if you find such numbers between 0 and 1, uh, that all probability AIs are less or equal than this expression, then we can conclude that the probability of the, uh, that the intersection of the complement of AIs is greater than 0. So you can avoid all of them. So you need. Uh, these auxiliary numbers, um, and so, but the good news is that it's not so, that you can think about it differently, um, that what this formula means, and after a little thinking, you can figure it out, that the, what this formula means is that if you take the probability of AI, and if you take the, well, the sum of the probability of the neighbors, so actually it's, it's wrong because I want to add to this sum not only the neighbors of AI, but also the probability of the AI itself. And if, it's, and if this sum, so just the guy plus the neighbors, is less than 1 over e. So it's kind of like you apply the union bound for a guy and the neighbors. But instead of 
applying the union bound with one, you have this slack, this E. So if the, all such sums for every I is less than, I mean, um, so it's less than one over E here, then we can have the conclusion like this. So this is the um, sort of some of the meaning of this formula, and you can see that if this holds, then indeed you can find ZIs. And I can tell you what the ZIs are roughly going to be. Well, each ZI is roughly going to be PI times E. So I apologize for this standard low one slow column again, but uh, I, I will put it up three times at least in this talk, and by the third time you might, you might start to like it. Um, so this is what we need uh, uh, in order to uh, prove the R3K bound. Okay, so let's see how we prove the R3K bound. So just a reminder, I'm just recapping, that so the probability of the AT events were P cubed. And so I have to, now for <coughs> every event AT, I have to have a variable and I have to set it somehow such that, such that the condition here of the standard LLL, this, this crucial condition, will hold. And also, the, I have the BS events, and the probabilities, again, that was like hard-earned calculation, right? This 1 minus P times choose, uh, to the K choose 2. And again, let's call the associated variable to Bs V5. I mean Vs, I am sorry, Vs. Okay, so now to apply the standard LLL, and here is like now you see it in action, uh, like how we are applying it. So for every AT, we have to have that the probability of AT should be less or equal so let's go back to the formula, right? So it have to be, in this formula, what you see is that it's a product where the associated variable occurs without the one minus, and the neighbors occur with the one minus, right? So let's see. So the for... Um, for, um, oh, because of symmetry, I forgot to tell that because of symmetry, I will want all z, t, so all these variables to have the same value z, and for these variables, I want to pick like all the variable v, I mean, that same value v, and so these have to be numbers between 0 and 1, the z and v. So, Again, so this, so, so then itself, so the itself is a z variable, and then all the neighbors with one minus. So we said that we have three n neighbors of triangle type, so each neighbor like gives a factor of one minus z, and there is, there are n choose k neighbors of the independent set type, and each such neighbor gives a factor 1 minus v. So if we want to apply the standard LLL, this is what this, this condition should hold, and again, we are still to pick z and v appropriately that this holds. And likewise, for the independent set, like in Again, just reminding you again, because this is like might be hard to remember that. So here is the probability. And so the probability should be less than the variable associated with AI times product one minus associated with the neighbors. And so 
here is the variable associated with bs. I mean, here is the probability of bs, and no matter what s, because they are synthetic, so for all, so this inequality stands for all s of size k, and this inequality stands for all triangle, uh, so because all inequalities are just the same for all triangles, and all inequalities are the same for all independent sets. So, um, I'm sorry. So, um, so here is the itself, and then the one minus z. So this, so how many triangles do I have? K choose two times n, which are neighbors, and so each is one minus z. And how many uh, independent sets I have, which are neighbors, n choose k, and each with one minus v. So, so these are the formulas, and so now. It's your turn to pick the z and v in the most advantageous way that would make n as large as possible. And again, I am just saving all the work for you because now it's just a, it's just a like a, an optimization problem, and that's not what I want to teach, like how to do optimization things when you have formula, so if you cleverly, if you are a combinatorial list or in any branch, somehow you can balance these things out. And it turns out that the best choice for the probability is roughly square root of n. And so I want to maximize n, but really what I am doing is I'm just saying, so the n is expressed in terms of k. And so the, I just said that the k is square root of n means the n is square root of k, is, is k squared, so however I am writing it. And the z is chosen like this, and the v is chosen such that the v to the n choose k is just a constant. So under all these choices, I simply, um, I simply get, um, I simply get, uh, no, further, even further. Uh, well, I did not write down these Ramsey numbers. It's, well, in any case, so what I, what I get is that the n is constant times k squared divided by ln k to the squared. So, and that's the bound I wanted to prove. So again, recapping, I applied this non-symmetric LLL. I found uh, the right Zs. I mean, first, I, in the, this probability setting, I computed, of course, the probabilities and the degree and the neighbors, and then I found the right Zs, and I optimized. And then, I, and then I got the formula. Now, uh, may yes? I, may I ask you something about this z variable? So, uh, on the previous slide. Yeah? So, so could you provide any, any physical meaning or any intuition behind this variables z? So, where, where do they come from? Um, some probabilities. Well, you are on the right track. So it's, of course, it's hard to give an intuition. But as I said, the Zs are the probability of Ais with a slack. So you should think of the Zis as the probability of Ais with a kind of a slack, like a probability of Ai times E. Right? The slack means that we are, that we are like, increasing it a little bit. And if you see the proof of the Lovas local lemma, you might get more intuition. Mm -hmm. And as we are going to the efficient Lovas local lemma, then you will get even more intuition. But before that, and this also goes in the direction of understanding disease, 
So here is the standard LLL. And here is the, the original LLL that I claimed. So now my question is, let me cast it to you, does the standard LLL imply the original LLL? So the standard LLL is supposed to be a more sophisticated version of the original LLL. So does it, does it imply the original LLL? So if it does, then how, how does it? Again, just by reading, it implies, right? But then, uh, how does it? Well, if you set, well, you set the probabilities to be equal, but this condition looks different from this condition. Sorry? Well, Well, exactly, exactly. So the question is like how you set the ZIs yeah. to prove this. Well, I have already provided. Okay, so is it the right thing? So, so is the probability of a i um, times e? So let's see what happens if we plug probability of a i times e into the z i's. Right? Then, um, <clears throat> actually, I am thinking it in reverse. In 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 in. I mean, so I am actually fixing D, and I am asking, so the probability of AI should be 1 over D times E, right? So let's assume that I am fixing D, and I want to show that if the probabilities are less or equal than 1 over D times E, then this holds, right? So so what would be, in this case, the ZIs? So now I am fixing D. Sorry? Just one, one divided by D. All right, so if, if now I am fixing D, so, the, so every guy has D neighbors, All right, then what is this product? So it's just 1 over E, right? And then the ZI was 1 over D, right? So what I get is that probability of AI is 1 over D times 1 over E, which is exactly this formula, right? But that's the same thing, or roughly the same thing, as saying that if now I am sort of fixing first the probability of AI, then I, should, um, then I should select the ZIs as probability of AI times E, because, you know, that's, so the 1 over D and the probability of AI are away by a factor of E. So, so far, that's the intuition we are, we are getting. Now, Again, you see the standard LLL, and here I am now stating it a little stronger, in a little stronger form. And um, so, so how is it stronger? So I'm claiming that not only that under this condition, the probability is greater than zero, but actually this probability is greater than this product, 1 minus zi times da da da, 1 minus zn. So under this condition, we can prove that this probability is, that the, we can prove this inequality. Now actually, this inequality is, is barely ever used 
or if ever, because this is this can be such a small number that it's not it's not really it's not really useful for us. However, it's very useful to write it down this way when we are actually proving the standard LLL. And so now you have seen in the previous slide that if I prove the standard LLL, then I am also proving the original LLL, because the original LLL is a consequence of the standard LLL. So now I am, so now I am just about to prove the Lovas local lemma. So if you don't hear this kind of dadam, then that's just because I don't have those uh, you know, those instruments. But, um, but so that's what's going to happen, so the proof. Um, so the proof, somehow, um, okay, so I am not, I'm not 100% satisfied how I wrote down the proof, but um, but one thing, no matter how you write down the proof, there is one thing that is always there. And that's this claim, I apologize again, this claim that, that, the, that this conditional probability, so under the condition, so under this condition, Right, under this condition, we have, and that's what that's this claim is what we prove first, is that the probability of AI conditioned on that we are avoiding a subset of the other events is at most ZI. Now you see from now you see here that the pro, so what is the probability of AI without the condition? Well, it's just the probability of AI, right? And so the ZIs are supposed to be the probability of AI and times some extra slack, right? So this is how you should think about this formula that um, so. The Z that that if I, that the ZIs are set so and and maybe that's the answer to your question that the ZIs are not just upper bounding the the probability of AIs, but they are upper bounding the probability of AIs conditioned on this kind of intersection. And so that's a little bigger, but not much bigger. Then, then that's what is good for us, that it's not much bigger than its upper bounding uh, the AIs. Okay, so let me prove this claim. So, um, so again, so S is just a subset of, of N, of 1 through N, and let me subdivide this S into the neighbors of AI, which is S1 here, and into the non-neighbors of SI of, of, of AI, which is S2. Now, so actually I should have drawn a picture. Maybe I, I can exercise my drawing powers. Um, so the picture is this, that so this is AI. And so here are the neighbors of AI. And so here is this set S, right, which is just a bunch of like other points. And so I am subdividing S into the neighbors of AI and into the non-neighbors. So the neighbors is S1 and the non-neighbors is S2. So you should think about it that way, about S1 and S2. 
OK, so now I am applying this um, inequality, we, I mean this equation, which maybe if the C was not there, because everything is conditioned on, on C, so without the C, it's just the rule of the conditional probability. So the conditional, pr so A conditioned on B is equal A inter probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B, and if I append a C here, and if I condition it here, that, that's still true. So I am, you, I am applying this on, on this expression. And so what are, what are going to be the B? Well, the B and the C are going to be the, um, well, again, these neighbors here and the non-neighbors there, right? So, so I'm intersecting the neighbor, so, so this uh, complement, so that's the C, right? So if I do that, then the B and C, or B intersect C, is just going to be exactly the entire S. So then this left-hand side under these replacements are just going to be exactly this. So the right-hand side is going to be um, well, so now I, I don't write what B is because in the next I'm just going to eliminate it. Um, but the C and the C appears here and here, right? Um, so it's just the intersections in S2. Right? And, then, and then the B, so this is the B actually, um, is those are that in S1. Okay, so nothing happened. I just applied this on this. I mean, I'm sorry, I applied this, and then the left-hand side was just our original expression that I want to bound, and the right-hand side was this. But now something happens that namely I just, whatever this B was, if I, so since this is an intersection, if I just drop it, then I just get a bigger number, or a bigger or equal number. So it's exactly the same expression, I dropped B. And why did I drop B? Because this contained the neighbors. So if I drop it, then the AI, and these are the non-neighbors, but the AI is completely independent of the non-neighbors. So if I am conditioning on something on which this is independent, then as if it was not there. So the denominator is the probability of AI, and the denominator is whatever it is. Right? This, uh, the neighbors inter complement intersection inside S, the non-neighbors complement intersection. So now, if we show that this ugly expression here is equal to this product, then we have proven the claim. So why have we proven the claim? Because by our assumption, the PAI, well, what we want to show is that, the, is that so the claim says, the claim simply says, if we can still remember, that this expression is less or equal than ZI. And what we have now is that is less or equal, not zi, but rather the probability of ai, which is actually less than zi, but it is divided by something. And so that something, of course, makes this, which originally less than zi, this whole thing, now it makes it zi. So, and that's because we have this inequality by our assumption that the probability of AI, like if I take it to the other side, then what we see here, ZI times this product, greater than probability of AI is just the LLL, is just the standard LLL assumption 
on AI, so then I am done. OK, so that's what I want to prove. And so now here comes something trivial, but it looks ultimately ugly. So um, it is probably the most trivial thing made the ugliest, the m ugliest way. Um, Oh, but now we have to turn twice. So, um, so that expression, so here we have the probability of some A, let's say J1 intersect A J2 intersect A J A J um, R conditioned on something like let's call this something X. Right? So how do you express this in another way? Well, if it was just one thing. Um, then um, you would express it as the probability, I'm sorry, and actually here there, these were complements. Like as a matter of fact, I don't even, I don't even want to I don't even want to write this coming to think about. Um, OK, I just want to write that, let's say, probability of A intersect B intersect C conditioned on some x. So how, so how would I do this? Well, this is equal to. Um, I write maybe now I'm just writing something nonsense, but hope not. So it's the probability of x times the probability of, let's say, c, I mean, c conditioned on x times probability of B conditioned on C intersection X times probability of A conditioned B intersection C intersection X. Now maybe I am I have completely messed it up, uh, but. Let's see if I said, did I, did I mess it up or I did not? So if I look at the conditional probability of like a large intersection conditioned on something, then I can slowly but safely, I am just, I am just expressing. So I'm looking at, um, I can also just thinking on like sort of pictorially that so this is x and so here is um, so here I have an intersection so I first I just want to express maybe this is not there it shouldn't be there right um, but so I want to I want to express this, so first I am just calculating this, and um, then I am intersecting with yet another thing and with yet another thing. And so each intersection, I am just looking at the, at the, at the fraction, like what is this intersection, what is it, which fraction is it of the previous intersection. So now, my, so now, 
I might have the completely wrong formula, but if I had a day, I would certainly have the right formula. <laughs> but this is for sure is the right formula, and so that's basically, that's just, that's just the same idea. That, so here I have this big intersection, and this, just, this is just expressed as a product of like all these things. But now, if I am looking at this one minus P H A K conditioned on something which is just an intersection of, of bunch of complements, and this, and how many of them are there where there are less than what I started with. So I can use induction, and so therefore this, this expression, this probability, is upper bounded by, let's say, z, j, k. Therefore, the 1 minus is lower bounded by, like, 1 minus z, j, k. So I have, so now each term just gives me these terms. And so that's how, and that's how I get this inequality. And so this is what I wanted, because I said that if I could just prove that, you know, that this denominator is this product, then this would work. So that's what I was working for. And here I just did that. I just proved that, that this was the denominator. This was the denominator. I just wrote down. Um, this intersection here, like this J in S1, I just wrote it down as, these, as this huge intersection. But so these are the elements of S1. And so these are the elements, well, these indices are the elements of S1. So, um, and so I have proven the claim. So I have the claim. And now for the very same reason, which I might put here wrong and which I used, and which I used before, so for the very same reason, so this is exactly for the same reason as this, when I am expressing this expression, when I am expressing this intersection, I can use all these uh, conditional, this chain of conditional probabilities, and each, and each one by the lemma or by the claim is each of these are upper bounded by the zi's, so I get the product of zi's. So recapping, the whole proof, met, the whole proof depended on this claim, which said that if that the not only that the probability of AI um, I have a well the probability of AI okay so how how to put this so so that the ZI sort of expressed this uh, conditional probability of AI. Okay so um, So in the last minutes, I want to talk about yet another problem. The, as you are all familiar with this problem, the K-set problem. So in the K-set problem, um, well, you have a, you have a conjunctive uh, form. Each conjunction, so that's the conjunction is an end. Each conjunction is a disjunction of K literals. And the literal is just a variable or negation. But you are all familiar with the case set. And so, so I want to prove that if a, in a case set, every variable occurs in at most uh, this many clauses, then phi is satisfiable. Now you might say that we have already proven this, or like almost we have proven this, 
because this looks awfully familiar with the K coloring, with the, with the coloring of K hypergraphs. And indeed, it's extremely similar. Um, so, um, oh, I'm sorry. So, um, so it's an extremely similar problem. And some, some of you asked that, so what do we know about the K coloring like for lower bound? Well, here I can tell you a trivial lower bound. Um, like, look at this K set. It has all, the, it has all possible clauses on K on fixed K variables. So all the two to the K clauses, right? So I know that if every point is contained in uh, in two to the k clauses, well, here what he says, so, but no more, then I can still find an instance, namely this, which is not satisfiable. In other words, I cannot improve the previous theorem beyond two to the k. So, So again, just let just for notation, let me call f for a for a k set instance, the um, the maximum number of clauses that contain any fixed variable. So, for instance, this variable is contained in five clauses. So the degree of this variable is five, and so I am maximizing that for all variables, and that's the f of the instance. So using that, well, I can rephrase this, this, pro this problem or theorem that if the degree of a k set is at most 1 over e times 2 to the k divided by k, then phi is satisfiable. Now, now here is how we can think of sparse k sets. So, if the if a if a k set is so now I'm so now I'm like I want to understand like sparsity versus satisfiability. So a very sparse k set where not where no clause intersect with no other clause is clearly satisfiable. So as the density grows, but the degree so meaning it's f regular with this parameter in that lemma, then it's still satisfiable due to the low and slow lemma. So now, if you go further, well, now let's consider random instances. So, so most of the instances are still satisfiable. So if I now want to compare like the random instances, like the density of random instances, I would draw meaning the number of clauses divided by the number of variables, we see that when it's like f regular with this parameter, it means that the density is 2 to the k divided by k squared divided by e. So at this point, like if it's regular, then it's everything is satisfiable. Well, if, it's, if it's this k squared disappears, so it's 2 to the k times log k, then a random instance, or that's kind of the threshold, where the random instance is still satisfiable. And if we go beyond that density, then the random instance is not satisfiable. So this is how, as it, the density grows, so, well, with the little cheating that now I am also putting a cup on how regular it is. So first, everything is satisfiable. And then still, like most instances are satisfiable. And then, then most instances are not satisfiable. And so um, this, this number, so let's go back to where all instances are satisfiable. So what is the degree? Well, the degree was actually studied heavily. Like what is, like every variable is contained for a three set is contained in at most three clauses. Then we know it's satisfiable. Actually, can you tell me why it's satisfiable? 
if you have a three set and every variable is contained in at most three clauses. Oh, so you heard an answer. So, okay, but why don't you tell it? Anyways. So you can match, you can designate to every, ver to every clause, you can designate uh, its own variable, sort of. So for F4, so, so, so for a four, for a four set instance, if every variable is contained in no more than four clauses, it's satisfiable, but for five, there are instances that are not satisfiable. But for five, we already don't know it, the, what the truth is. It can be anything, five, six, or seven. So we know for sure that if it's, if it's five, every variable is contained in no more than five clauses, it's satisfiable, but we don't know what to conclude when every variable is contained in six or seven. And we know that there are instances where every variable is in eight, which is not satisfiable. So these F numbers are interesting. And again, for K set, the challenge is to compute this F number, and that's where the low column are helpful, and that's where this, this theorem uh, uh, or this claim is helpful. And it goes in the exact same way as the coloring. I don't even know whether I write it down, but I don't write down again. Um, and there is one more slide, but that one more slide opens a completely new story about the Lovas local lemma. Namely, we want to um, we want to make variants and improvements on the Lovas local lemma. And so, since I am two minutes over time, then I definitely don't get into that story, even if it's just a new slide. So at this point, I am thanking you, your attention, and I am continuing with the new slide tomorrow. Thank you.